Hey folks, let's talk about some goth shit. There are certain places you expect to find skulls, like in bodies, on the shelf of a witch's hut, maybe in some kind of like lab or something. Where you don't expect to find them is in tree stumps. But when you stumble upon one in a tree stump with something stuffed inside their mouth and a wedding ring close by, something is very clearly wrong. This case is haunting and it gripped me ever since I found out about it. It might sound like some kind of folk horror, but it's not. It's painfully real. It's an utter tragedy that we still don't know the identity of the victim or who put her in a witch elm and why. I've done some deep diving and have read through newspapers from the 1940s and 50s to try and bring you an accurate portrayal of what exactly happened and the steps that were taken in the 50s and 40s to try and find the culprit. But I'm afraid if you're looking for a solid answer, then there kind of isn't one, but stick with me because there are a few theories that could really explain what happened. I'm Zoe Dells, and this is the mystery of who put Bella in the witch elm. It was the 18th of April 1943 and deep inside the Hagley Woods, someone's body was about to be found. Hagley Woods is in Stourbridge, kind of close to Birmingham, and like the rest of the UK, it wasn't an easy place to live in 1943. Amidst the backdrop of World War II, some local boys decide to go hunting for some bird eggs. Their names were Bob Farmer, Robert Hart, Fred Payne and Tom Willits. It was World War II and being young lads, the rations weren't really enough to fill their bellies, so along with their dogs, they decided to go to Hagley Woods to try and find some extra protein. While they were technically poaching, I don't really blame them. What they were doing was described as bird nesting in local newspapers and the fact that there's a name for it kind of implies that it was done widely across the country. Besides, I doubt Lord Cobham, who owned Hagley Woods Estate, would have really missed a few bird eggs. Searching the trees for any nests, they were having a normal day. Until Robert saw the witch elm. This witch elm was about six feet tall and yet somehow was just a stump. And seeing as it was hollow inside, Robert thought it was the perfect place for there to be a bird nest. It was about 24 inches wide at the top and then 17 inches wide at the bottom and you'll understand later on why these measurements are particularly important. It was also 35 yards away from the nearby Hagley Wood Lane, which will also become important later on. As Robert thought there might be a nest in the tree, he decided to climb up and have a look inside. Staring back at him was a skull. It was lying on its right side, and chillingly, scraps of skin and hair were still attached to the bone. To say the boys were shocked is an understatement. I can't imagine what it must be like to find a skull let alone when you're just having like a normal day with your friends. So by the sounds of what happened next, it sounds like the other boys couldn't quite believe that he'd found a skull, which is fair enough. So Robert raked it out with a stick to show them and then they all got suitably spooked and put it back. This obviously has implications in terms of evidence and the placement of the body later on, but it was too late by then. This next bit is quite sad, but the boys were so scared of repercussions from being on Lord Cobham's estate that they swore not to tell anyone. With World War II going on, I'd imagine they didn't want to cause much more trouble and also probably were scared of getting caught for poaching, so I understand why they were worried about revealing their discovery. But Tom Willits just couldn't stop thinking about the skull. He eventually told his parents the next day, who then rung the police, and all of this kicked off. Tom even accompanied the police right back to the witch elm and showed them where they had found the skull. Upon closer inspection, they not only found skin still on the skull, but hair as well, and there was hair tangled on the inside of the trunk. Now, you'd assume that after a while being there, as we'll find out, the hair would kind of have deteriorated, but I assume the stump kind of protected the hair from the elements somewhat, so that's why they were still able to find scraps of it inside the tree. If the body had been outside of the tree, the hair might have been washed away or taken away by animals or something, but also having hair trapped inside of the stump kind of implies that whoever was put in there was like, stuffed in there as if you were getting in somewhere like that deliberately you'd want to keep your hair like close to you because it really hurts when it gets snagged on things so again 
Another thing to bear in mind later on. A local medical examiner called Professor James Webster was called to the scene and he decided that the tree needed to be cut open to see what was inside, which is fair enough. He was also worried about the kind of damage that might be done to the remains by pulling them out of the top of the witch elm, so yeah, that makes sense also. Underneath the skull itself, there were more bones, including a femur, some scraps of clothes, a shoe, and even some finger bones scattered around the trunk of the tree. Once Professor Webster had looked at the remains, he surmised that they belonged to a woman. I'm gonna call her Bella, because to be honest, this case has been going around for so long that I kind of feel just sad that we still don't know who it is. I'm gonna be calling her Bella because of some messages that appear later on, but also I feel like it's important to keep calling her Bella so that you realize that this is a woman who died. It's not some kind of like, quirky, folk horror-y like tale to tell kids at bedtime. A woman was killed by someone and we still don't know her identity, so calling her Bella makes her feel like more of a rounded individual, just to kind of like emphasize that someone died here and we should take that seriously. I just don't want to forget that she was a real woman and she didn't deserve to die in this way. So Professor Webster quickly realized that Bella had been put into the witch elm feet first. And although it had been a number of months since she had been put in there, remarkably, there were still scraps of her clothes and her personal effects. So in the trunk, they found costume jewelry, which is basically jewelry that's made to look super expensive, but is often made out of, say, glass instead of diamonds and stuff, a rolled gold wedding ring, which was the more affordable type of wedding rings you could get back then, some clothes in the form of a blouse and a skirt, and also a size five shoe with crepe soles, and yes, again, that will Will be important later. Weirdest of all, Bella was found with taffeta stuffed into her mouth. It had been put in there with such vicious vigour that it was still there months after she had been put in the witch elm. During World War II, taffeta was used in petticoats and nightgowns, although some people suggested that the boys used it to like, I don't know, dampen the blow of the stick as they tried to pull the skull out, but what boy would just walk around with a length of taffeta in his pocket, so that just does make sense to me. In fact, the taffeta looked like it was ripped from her clothes, so whoever had put it in her mouth had just ripped it off of her. A handbag was also found near the tree, but this turned out to be nothing as it was just stolen and it was reunited with its owner later on. So Bella's remains were removed from the witch elm, Professor Webster took control of them, and then a date for the police inquest was set. On the 29th of April 1943, an inquest was held in Stourbridge, so that's almost two weeks after her body was discovered, and the boys were brought to give their statements about how they found her remains in the first place. Professor Webster also gave more detailed findings on what he had discovered about the body too. Bella was between 25 and 40 years old, probably around 35 at the time of her death, had given birth once, was five feet tall, and had brown hair. And judging by the wear on her wedding ring, she'd been wearing it for about four years. Webster decided that she was probably killed in around October 1941, judging by the state of decomposition of the body and the fact that her remains were partly skeletonized by the time they found her. So she was inside the witch elm for 18 months before she was found. We don't know exactly what factors Webster used to determine how long she'd been in the tree stump, because you'd assume she was exposed to the elements for those months she was in there, so perhaps it could have accelerated the decay of her body, but either way, Webster's the expert and he says 18 months, so we're gonna go with 18 months. Interestingly, Webster couldn't find any marks of violence on Bella's body, and so he suggested that she had probably been asphyxiated. Again, the inherent problem here is that Webster is basically doing what he can with the remains, but as they're mostly skeletonized, you don't have any of the soft tissue like around the neck or any other limb to try and see if there are bruises or injuries or scratch marks, which would usually indicate how someone was killed. So I guess he went for asphyxiation because it's kind of the only thing you can decide upon. And the fact that she had taffeta stuffed in her mouth does indicate that she probably died due to a lack of oxygen. So because of that, I'm gonna assume that what Professor Webster meant when he said he couldn't find any marks of violence is that there were no broken bones or anything or fractures that would indicate that she'd been like hit on the head or struck in the neck or something, hence why he went for strangulation as how she was killed. This bit is pretty grim. Webster said that Bella had to have been put inside the witch elm when she was still warm, as the rigor mortis that would have set in after her death would have made it impossible to fit her in there. So whoever killed her 
put her in there pretty sharpish. Someone murdered Bella and then within a few hours put her in the witch elm. So although we don't really know what injuries she might have had when she died because of the decomposition of her soft tissue, we do know what she was wearing. The scraps of clothes found underneath her in the witch elm can actually be put together to give a pretty good impression of not only the type of clothes she was wearing, so the blouse and the skirt, but also their colour, which as you can imagine, probably really helps when you're trying to find a missing person. Bella was dressed in a mustard skirt, a blue and yellow striped cardigan, with a light blue belt, blue crepe soled shoes, and chillingly, a peach coloured taffeta petticoat. That's the very same taffeta that was found in her throat over a year later. Then to try and jog the memory of anyone who might know Bella, Webster had a um, interesting idea. He made a full life-size dummy of Bella and made it wear the clothes that Bella had been found in, though obviously reconstructed and not the scraps of fabric they found that were probably real icky by then. I've not found any photographs of this dummy, but I do know that it was shown to the jury at the inquest that was conducted at Stourbridge. During that inquest, the jury didn't want to see the skeleton, they instead just relied on photographs, so I don't know if that's relevant to anything else, but I just found that was interesting that they just relied on photographs and not actually going to see the remains of the body, but you know. At the inquest, rather predictably, a verdict of murder by person or persons unknown was returned. So this bit is really frustrating and annoys me even now. After the inquest was done, Professor Webster gave Bella's remains away. These remains were given to a fellow professor and we have no idea where they are now. They've tried to search for them recently, but just no clue where they could be. So. That's great, because obviously now we can use DNA testing on the bones or some of the hair remains to try and find out who she was, but because Webster decided to just give her remains away, don't know what happened to them. Great. So now the journey starts to try and identify Bella. Way back in July 1941, a police report was made that could have actually documented the time and date of Bella's death, though we can't really be sure. This is what happened. A local businessman was returning to his home in Hagley Green when he heard the scream of a woman come from the wood next to him, which was Hagley Woods. A bit shaken and disturbed, he decided to just keep on walking and he met a school teacher coming in the other direction. They chatted for a bit and it turns out the school teacher had heard the exact same scream as well, so they went to go find a policeman and report what they had heard. Not wanting to just leave, they decided to help the constable search the woods, but they never found anything. So despite this report, which wasn't mentioned in the newspapers at the time, only a couple of days later, the police had come up with an idea of how Bella might have been killed. That report wasn't mentioned in the newspapers at the time, so I'm not sure whether the police were aware of it back then as it relates to Bella's case, but regardless, a day after the inquest, the police already had an idea of what might have happened to Bella. They thought Bella must have been attacked and then killed in the middle of an air raid and then put inside the witch elm, so they did kind of a massive announcement asking for anyone who had a missing relative to come forward and see if Bella could possibly be them. Hey Toto, a cat might jump up soon. I have a cat now. So the case became really well known in the area, so much so that just the day afterwards, on the 30th of April, one of the local newspapers reported that people had already come forward and tried to see if Bella was one of their missing friends or relatives. Unfortunately, although the police went over 3,000 missing persons cases, none of them were a match to Bella. Toto, what are you doing? Ridiculous cat. At Alos Feliz, the police decided to try and find out where her shoes came from. They were quite distinctive as they had a crepe sole and were blue, so might as well give it a go. Hello. The shoes were traced back to the Waterfoot Company from Lancashire, and the police found all but four pairs of the shoes. Those four pairs had been sold in a market in Dudley, which was pretty close to Birmingham and therefore Stourbridge, so it's distinctly possible that Bella was a local. Investigators also went through local dental records to see if they could find anyone who matched Bella's teeth as she had a pretty distinctive set of chompers. Her front teeth overlapped, just like mine, and there was also a distinctive lack of one of the tooths which is the way I'm gonna pull it, sure, that looked like it was removed by a professional so she can't have done it at home. 
But despite this, which is pretty distinctive when it comes to dental records, the police didn't find anything. They contacted every dentist in the area, but didn't turn up any leads. Honestly, the police really did try with this one, it seems. I mean, going by the newspaper reports at the time, at least. As the NHS was formed in 1948, I don't really think there was like a centralized database they could draw on. So again, this lead came to nothing. And with all the leads completely dried up, Bella's case went cold. That is until the 1st of April 1944. A message appeared on the side of an abandoned building in Upper Dean Street in Birmingham. It read, who put Bella in the witch elm Hagley Wood? Hence why I'm calling her Bella. Two days later, Hagley Wood Bella was found written on some nearby buildings, and then the same message as the first one, with the mention of the Witch Elm, instead they called her Lua Bella though, was found written on one of the buildings in Stourbridge, which was where the inquest was held. The police thought that whoever killed Bella must have written these messages, as they were all written by the same person. But local police didn't know any Bella or Lua Bella, and they questioned local residents, and no one knew anyone by that name either. It wasn't until 1953, almost 10 years later, that the police found who wrote the messages, uh, and he's just described as a crank in the newspapers from the time, but again, another lead that went cold. However, the message who put Bella in the witch elm would stay in the local consciousness and national consciousness for a really long time, as evidenced by the fact that I'm making a video about it in 2022. So although the guy wasn't the person who killed Bella or knew anything about her, at least he kind of made it stick in people's minds, I guess. In fact, similar messages can still be found today. In 1999, one was even found on the Hagley Hall obelisk, which is near the Hagley Wood Estate, if I remember correctly. So people are still thinking about Bella all those years later. In October 1949, the police decided to reopen Bella's case and held a conference beside the very witch elm in which she was found. It was then revealed that a Midland soldier could have given testimony that indicated when Bella was killed and possibly who by. But as it was just kind of a witness statement, they couldn't really do much with it. Here's why. The soldier reported that he had seen travellers arguing near the Witch Elm in 1942 and the police were satisfied that he wasn't lying. But as it was now 1949, all those leads had again dried up because the travellers had moved on. As you'll find out, because it's in some of the other cases that I'm going to cover on this channel, travellers are used as a scapegoat in quite a lot of circumstances, which um, sucks. So the fact that this soldier reported travellers arguing kind of just indicates the prevalent mood of the day that, you know, outsiders could be responsible for murders rather than it happening in their very own town and being conducted by someone who they might know. So yeah, that's what I think of that story. So newspaper reports became rarer and rarer from 1949 onwards and eventually dried up completely. 1955 saw Webster give the dummy he had made of Bella's body to the Birmingham Medical School and then in 1958 he decided to go on TV. Webster said on TV that the police had identified Bella's body but he couldn't say who it was and neither could the police. So who knows if he was telling the truth or not. That's pretty much everything that happened. There's a couple of other things which interest interesting that I'll mention later on, but now we're going to move on to the theories bit. Who could have killed Bella and why would you put her in a witch elm? The first one is pretty obvious. Hagley Wood Lane is an isolated lane and it was known to be used by courting couples for nighttime activities, if you know what I mean. Because of the witch elm's proximity to Hagley Wood Lane, to me it seems possible that Bella was killed in one of the cars that go to Hagley Wood Lane to, you know, do their things or whatever, and then she was quickly stuffed in the elm afterwards. Because of the witch elm's proximity to Hagley Wood Lane, there's a couple of possibilities about how Bella could have gotten into the witch elm. The first is that she was driven there by a lover or a client if she was a sex worker, and something happened in the car that resulted in her death. And then whoever was driving the car or whoever was there with her decided to try and hide her body in the witch elm to escape justice. Regarding the witch elm, it is a weird place to put a body. I feel like you'd only know to put a body in a local witch elm if you knew the area as you had to know Hagley Wood Lane was isolated. You also had to know that the witch elm was close by so you could carry a body there 
fairly easily, I guess. And also, you'd have to know the witch elm was hollow inside. So surely whoever killed Bella must have had some kind of knowledge of the area, which implies that they'd been living there for a while or they were a local. Plus, they had to move pretty quickly to get her in the witch elm before rigor mortis set in. So you wouldn't just go driving around for like two or three hours and then come across a witch elm because you wouldn't occur to you to look in a witch elm or a tree to try and hide a body. So again, whoever put Bella in the witch elm, I personally think, must have known it was there. If it wasn't a local who had killed Bella, you'd assume that they just put her body in a ditch or perhaps buried under some leaves in the woods or buried somewhere they wouldn't just stick her in a tree. So yeah, I'm pretty convinced it was a local. Then there's the fact that Bella wore a wedding ring. Judging from some of the stories my grandma told me about what it was like being a single mother in the 60s, Bella might have worn a wedding ring to try and make people leave her the fuck alone because she had a child, so she probably just didn't want people prying into her business. Equally, she could have been married. So then that raises the question that if she was married and she had a child, why did no one report her missing? Perhaps Bella was a sex worker and her partner and child just weren't aware of what she did. Or the other option is that Bella was killed by her partner. Or her partner could have been conscripted into World War II so there wasn't anyone to report her missing. Her child could have also been evacuated somewhere else because there was a munitions factory in Hagley so... Yeah, there might just not been anyone to report her missing, which is kind of sad. I just have to talk about the taffeta too, because stuffing taffeta down someone's throat is vicious. You don't stuff taffeta down someone's throat if you merely dislike them. To me, this feels like either they think Bella did something wrong, or they just didn't like what Bella stood for. So again, that could have implied that she was a sex worker because we all know that sex workers are targeted by people like this because often the police don't look into their cases as deeply because they lead what the police call a high risk lifestyle, which is absolute bullshit. Over the years, people have had their own theories about what could have happened to Bella. One of them comes from Professor Margaret Murray, who's a folklorist and a professor of philosophy. She thinks that Bella could have been killed as part of a witchcraft ritual. Professor Murray argues that this is because Bella's hand was found 13 paces from the tree, which is stretching the facts already, as we know that Bella's finger bones were found kind of scattered around the base of the tree itself. Professor Murray then suggests that her missing hand could have been used in a hand of glory ritual. A hand of glory is the preserved left hand of a murderer who was hung at the gallows, or alternatively, the hand that did the deed. The idea is that if you turn it into a candle, it will bestow great power upon you and can unlock any locked door. The massive issue I have with this, and I'm pretty sure you can think of it already, is that Bella wasn't hung at the gallows, so even if you did take her body parts, the Hand of Glory ritual wouldn't work in the first place. And if I was in that situation, I'd do my due diligence and make sure the person I was killing was actually decent for the Hand of Glory ritual which Bella isn't. The more likely prospect is that Bella's finger bones were found scattered at the base of a tree because wild animals got to her body and as they consumed parts of her, they dropped the bones around the tree. That's probably it. Then there's the spy theories. This might sound strange, but remember, Bella was killed at the height of World War II, so there's the real possibility that people could have thought she was a German spy and could have killed her for that fact. In 1953, the Wolverhampton Express received a letter from someone who would only call herself Anna of Claverley. These letters would bring the case of who put Bella in the witch elm right back into the public eye, as this is what Anna said. As much as I hate having to use a nom de plume, I think you would appreciate it if you knew me. The only clues I can give you are that the person responsible for the crime died insane in 1942, and the victim was Dutch and arrived in England illegally about 1941. I have no wish to recall anymore. Okay, Anna, thanks for that. Police were understandably quite interested in speaking to her further about Bella, and reluctantly, Anna agreed to a meeting. According to Anna, her ex-husband was a conspirator with the enemy and would coordinate with them and feed them information so they knew where to direct their attacks when bomb raids happened. Anna couldn't keep up her nom de plume for that long though once she started to talk to police. She was soon identified as Una Mossop, whose ex-husband and alleged conspirator was Jack Mossop, who was in the Royal Air Force. Alarmingly, Una claimed that Jack had seen Bella get killed and he knew who killed her. According to Jack, Bella was killed by a Dutchman called Van Rolt. One night, Jack was in a bar with Van Rolt and Bella and Van Rolt found out that Bella was a spy and he strangled her, 
presumably not knowing that Jack was also a spy. The reason I look like this when I'm saying this is because the story is dodgy as hell as Una told another different version of the story as well. The second version of the story is that Jack, Bella and Van Rolt were drinking in a pub and Bella had a bit too much to drink. So, to teach her a lesson, Jack and Van Rolt decided to take her drunk body and put her in the Witch Elm to teach her to stop drinking so much? I guess? This just seems wild to me. The story goes on that Bella couldn't get out once she'd been put in, so she died in there, but as you'll have realised, this leaves out the fact that she was found with taffeta in her mouth. And also, why would someone do that to a person? I can't imagine why that would come into anyone's head to put your drunk friend into the stump of a tree and to teach them a lesson nonetheless. It just... It just doesn't sound plausible. Una goes on to allege that Jack was put into a mental institution because the discovery of Bella's body caused him to have a mental breakdown. Police did try to find this Van Rolt character, but they ended up with nothing. And as Una's story had changed a couple of times since they had met her, the police decided to disregard what she had to say. Moving on to spy theory number two, because yes, there is another one. There's this guy called Joseph Jacobs who parachuted into the England to be a spy for the Germans. He broke his ankle when he landed, was found by farmers, and when they spoke to him, he said he was waiting to meet up with a girl called Clara. Specifically, she was called Clara Bell. I think I'm saying that correctly, sorry if I'm not, but she never met up with him. People thought that Bella might be Clara, but this is categorically not true. Clara actually died in Berlin in 1942 from veronal poisoning, so again, nothing came of that either. Now we get to talk about the latest developments on the case, which you'd be surprised, there are quite a few. Over 50 years later, police reopened Bella's case. In 2005, the West Mercia Constabulary reopened Bella's case and re-examined all of the evidence they had, minus her remains because we don't know what Webster did with them. They ended up closing her case again in July 2005. That doesn't mean people have given up trying to find out who she was though. Caroline Wilkinson, who reconstructed the face of Richard III after he was found, gave Bella the same treatment in an effort to try and show people what she would have looked like when she was alive, and urged people to look through their family albums and see if anyone who went mysteriously missing matches what Bella would have looked like. So far, no one's come forward, but if you want to show this picture to your older relatives to maybe see if they recognise her, her from a family album or something that could really help in trying to identify Bella. You should report anything you find to the West Mercia Constabulary because I imagine they'll probably want to know too. Really, a good place to start would be trying to identify Bella and then go from there. But again, as we don't have Bella's remains, we can't do DNA testing on the hair that was left behind on her skull. Police volunteers have searched for her, but they couldn't find anything. Unfortunately, as Bella was found during World War II and then Webster gave her remains away, I think during the chaos of World War II it's really unlikely that we're going to actually find her remains, which sucks. And then there's the fact that as she was killed in 1941, whoever killed her is probably dead by now, so Bella's never going to get any justice. But as long as we keep talking about her, there still remains the slim possibility that Bella could be identified. The reason I keep referring to her as Bella throughout this video, as I said before, is because I don't want us to forget that she was a real woman who got murdered. Often people hear the phrase, who put Bella in the witch elm, and it's kind of told as like a story of like a spooky thing that happened, but someone lost their life and it's not fair that we don't know who did it and that we can't even know who Bella is. Whoever she was and whatever she is, I don't think she deserved to die, less of all by being stuffed in a witch elm. What do you think? If you want to chuck your thoughts in the comments below, then please do, because I'll be in there too, theorising along with you. If you want to know more about Bella's case, then I really recommend the books by Alex Merrill. They've written two books on Bella already, and I'd really recommend thumbing through them if you're interested at all, because they have incredibly intricate details that I did not have the time to include here. It really is a fantastic piece of research, so have at it. And now the typical YouTube bit. Do feel free to like and subscribe to my channel. I'll be doing more of these cases in the future. I'm I'm probably going to centre on these kind of like strange happenings in the past uh, because I really like old true crime cases. So if you're interested in true crime cases from anywhere from the Victorian period to before, and I mean literally the Tudors or the Georgian times, judging by what I've dug up so far, then do chuck me a sub. You can also follow me on Twitter, Instagram and Twitch at Zoe underscore Dells. Now all that's left for me to say is I'll see you rat bastards next time.